A little background, Professor Edward P.J. Corbett joined Ohio State's Department of English in 1966, and he spent his career as an outstanding scholar in the field of rhetoric and composition. The Corbett Lecture was established in 1999 through the generosity of Professor Corbett's estate. And each year we seek a respected scholar in the field of rhetoric and composition to deliver this memorial address. We're thankful to the co-sponsors of this event, which includes Ohio State's Global Arts and Humanities Discovery theme, Dr. Antoinette Miranda in the Casto Interprofessional Education Professorship, and Ohio State's Office of Diversity and Inclusion. My name is Krista Teston. I am the Vice Chair of Rhetoric, Composition, and Literacy Studies here in the Department of English, and it is my privilege to introduce this year's Corbett lecturer, Dr. Urs Ursula Orr. Dr. Orr is an Associate Professor of African and African American Studies and Rhetoric at Arizona State University. Professor Orr's book, Lynching, Violence, Rhetoric, and American Identity, was the winner of the 2020 Rhetoric Society of America Book Award. Dr. Orr's scholarship has appeared in numerous journals, including Pedagogy, Women's Studies and Communication, Rhetoric Society Quarterly, Quarterly Journal of Speech. I could go on and on and on. But in addition to these peer-reviewed spaces, Dr. Orr is a powerhouse in the public sphere. In fact, you may have heard Dr. Orr's ver voice on NPR the other day, and then this morning on Live with Ariva Martin, as she's been asked to appear as a special guest as public discussions about the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill have ensued. In today's talk, Unruly Dispositions, Civility in Motion, The Case of Sandra Bland, Professor Orr draws from a larger project on citizenship and gendered anti-Black violence. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions at the end of Dr. Orr's lecture, so I won't belabor the introduction any more than I already have, except to say this. We are thrilled, and more than that, honored, to be able to share intellectual space with you today, Dr. Orr. Ever since I met you a few years ago at a conference and somehow I was able to tag along with you and Donnie Sake for lunch, I have been in awe of you and your work. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for sharing your work. Please join me in welcoming this year's distinguished Corbett lecturer, Dr. Ursula Orr. Dr. Teston, thank you so very much for that very gracious um, invitation. I'm looking forward to the next time I get to physically hold space with you. Um, I am honored to be here with you all today to deliver the 2022 Corbett Lecture. Again, thank you so very much for the invitation. Um, and I would like to say, um, that I am going to work to be to pace myself. I have a tendency to get a little excited. Um, and I'm trying to be mindful of that. Uh, and I appreciate your grace and your patience. I'm also very much looking forward to the Q&A as this is an ongoing work in progress and part of a larger project um, that I'm excited to share with you all today. Today, I'm going to share a few thoughts on civility, temporality, and gendered anti-Blackness. This lecture is part of a larger project titled Civility While Black and Female, which examines the regimes of power that inform how discourses of civility stigmatize, criminalize, dissect, diagnose, and pathologize Black women's self-possession. In America, to be a self-possessed Black woman is to be crazy, deranged, mad, and threatening on account that anti-Blackness is underwritten by a fundamental denial of Black humanity, Black liberty, and Black freedom. Black women's unruly dispositions, i.e. their supposed incivility, then might best be understood as a response to modernity's unjust civil ordering. Following Frank Wilderson, to be crazy is to demand an account for the loss incurred through racial capitalism to triangulate one's capacity and the loss of their body and corporal integrity. Scholars have investigated civility as a democratic good, as a mode of discipline and as a mode of containment. Less consideration, however, has been given to the chronopolitics of civility, that is, to the way civility discourse conveys a sense of time and timing. What I share today investigates how appeals to civility, while leveled against Black women, 
signal a nostalgia for a stereotype Black past in which the premier model of respectable, respectable Black womanhood is man. Taking the July 10th, 2015 stop of Sandra Bland as its point of departure and thinking specifically about how massage and war arrests, takes up time and depletes the lived time of Black women. This lecture places scholarship on civility in conversation with scholarship on temporality and gendered anti-Blackness, excuse me, and gendered anti-Black policing to consider the way civility manifests temporally as capture in the lives of Black women. What I'll share today is a work in progress that, uh, that will proceed in three parts. I'll begin by offering a brief review of scholarship and civility, and then I'll offer a heuristic for reading civility as a mutilating form of racial temporality before applying this heuristic to the dialogic of Bland's July 10th, 2015 stop. I'll conclude by offering a few thoughts on Bland's counter temporal orientation and the weight of her statement of, I'm waiting on you. On really dispositions, civility and motion, the case of Sandra Bland. If politics denotes the means by which social actors navigate the challenges of civic community, then civility denotes a means by which such navigation is presumed achievable. Political philosophers think of civility as it relates to citizens' ability to negotiate political community, and as such, frame civility as a civic virtue on account of its assumed transcendental quality. America's liberal democratic tradition posits civility as a virtue of worth on account that quote, treating people as equally dignified subjects, and quote, during times of disagreement and difference, encourages the kind of social engagement and robust deliberation requisite for a viable democratic community. Within this tradition of manners, civility denotes politeness, courteousness, and considerateness, and is valued most amid instances of difference and disagreement because it is assumed to express the dis that despite difference and differences, diverse perspectives, that is, the voices of others, are valued. In this way, civility is conceived as a good, a practice of egalitarianism. This, however, is civility the ideal. Civility the practice is less of an equalizing force. As cultural critics, historians, and communication scholars have detailed, civility isn't about exercising mutual respect as much as it is about managing dissent in ways that accommodate the dominant social order. Historically, deployed as a means of social control and containment, civilizing strategies in the form of legal, political, and physical restrictions, discursive and physical violence, and modes of looking, have they continued to serve as powerful practices of race and gender discipline. Critical scholarship on civility demonstrates how civility evades calls for change and justice by masquerading as morality, by masquerading as care and compassion and by labeling disagreeable forms of communication as overreach, inappropriate, and violent. Labeling disagreement uncivil frames said speech and the bodies from which said speech emanates as threats to be contained. Such tactics which serve to silence and punish marginalized groups make civility a generative site for the production of what Bonilla Silva calls new racism. Distinguished by the explicit and overt racism of the past, the new racism operates, quote, as a racist articulation of a racist expression that masks the conniving egoism and violence of men and women with a reputation for refined manners, end quote. Defining civility as, quote, strategically inscribed and embedded violence, David Goldberg contends that because the modern expression of civility is driven by anti-Blackness, that 21st century appeal to civility reflect the logics of a quote, born again racism. This notion of civility as born again signals a temporal orientation akin to a racially ordered past. Race and temporality. Time is not infinite. However, those who own time, that is those who have the power to determine when time begins and ends, the power to determine the pace of the day and the power to maintain possession of time have gained ownership of time through violent acts of transference in which time is differentially allocated in ways that reinscribe racial and social hierarchies. And too late racialized time in the closure of the past, Ali, As Ali Asaji analyzes Fanon's account of the white gaze to extrapolate a theory of racialized time as closure. Specifically, Al, Al, excuse me, Al Sajay, 
Al Saji, excuse me, reads Fanon's encounter as a moment of temporal dislocation, an instance in which Fanon's racialized body is displaced from history and relegated to what she calls a closed past. As she explains, the instance in, in which Fanon sees how he is seen is the instance in which he is figured as perpetually inhabitant of a time outside of progress. Racism immobilizes and eclipses Fanon's capacity for a future beyond, quote, the stereotype Black past. He is therefore always behind, always late, forever stuck, and always looking back on account of the kind of paranoia racial temporalization engenders. The closed past, Al Saji concludes, cuts Blacks off from an open future on account of rendering them stuck in the past. In engaging Al Saji, Helen Nong carefully reminds that the past is, quote, never fully closed over or sealed off, but rather sustained through retention, the lingering or residue of the past and the present and future, and protension, which names the futural anticipation of what is not yet fulfilled or what might never come to be fulfilled. Consequently, the past is never really the past or closed, but rather continuously reproduced through the past, present, future instances of anti-Black violence. Such continuity is the way whiteness functions as time sucks that strip, take up, and waste time in ways that exhaust and deplete the life force and live time of racialized others. Continental philosopher Charles Mills describes this phenomenon of time and life force depletion as, quote, temporal deprivation, the temporal deprivation of time, to signal the particularly extractive and transactional nature of what he calls white time. As a, quote, regime of temporal exploitation and accumulation, end quote, white time sustains the status quo of racial hierarchy by, quote, transforming time from one set of lives to another, end quote, explains Mills because white time is a racial regime of exploitation that turns on access and notions of ownership, acts of temporal deprivation, which by nature diminish the life expectancy of racialized others, makes questions about time indistinguishable from questions about race and injustice. Not completely unlike Fanon's experience with the closed past, Hortense Spiller's experience of time as capture exhibits anti-Blackness as an arresting seizure of bodily will that names her through, quote, metaphors of captivity and mutilation so that, it is as, so that it is as if neither time nor history nor historiography or its topics show movement, end quote. Capture, explains Spillers, is a time of torturous immobility as, quote, the human subject is murdered over and over again by the passions of a bloodless and anonymous agonism, showing itself in endless disguise. For Spillers, Anti-Blackness is a mutilating temporality that renders her, quote, a marked woman. As marked, she is subjected to the intergeneralization death sentence that is anti-Blackness, to an incessant and continuous murdering of the self that, like Fanon, eclipses her capacity to move beyond a stereotyped Black past. Consequently, she is rendered stuck, immobile, Following Spillers, there is no forward movement from those marked by the history of anti-Black, anti-Blackness inaugurated under chattel slavery. No progression towards liberation, only the facade of freedom and the promise of captivity. This experience of capture, as Simone Brown explains, is the quote, negative inheritance of the slave's progeny, end quote. The result of the un of unfinished emancipations manifest as a past that contemporary Blacks relive as their presence. As these scholars illustrate, anti-Blackness produces a temporal orientation, orientation achieved through a forgetting and denial that not only, quote, masks the operations of racism, but also reifies the human as an exclusionary category that demands an outside, end quote, and which requires the death of Black people. The point to recognize here is that white temporal rhetorics close off time, attend discourses of erasure and atonement to alleviate white guilt, and assume the futuristic orientations of whiteness through narratives of progress constituted by Black death. In these ways, white temporal rhetorics forestall Black, Indigenous, and non-Black futures. Part two, Black women and the temporal orientation of civility. Scholarship tracing the long history of Black women and the carceral state links the removal of Black domestic labor from white homes as the root for criminalizing the ways Black women show up in public. 
Black feminist scholars, including Collins, Higginbotham, and Cooper, have demonstrated how charges of incivility are commonly leveled at women whose public performances challenge the normalized script of respectability and acquiescence to white dominance. As a performance of moral worthiness that aligned with dominant values of the good and the virtuous woman, respectability was employed by Black women in defense against negative stereotypes of us as lazy, hypersexual, unethical, uncivil, and animalistic. According to Ele uh, Evelyn Bro Brooks Higginbotham, the rhetorical utility of respectability was that it functioned as, quote, a bridge discourse that mediated race relations by aligning Black women's behavior with dominant societal values and expectations. While such performances led to levels of social mobility, they also created a double bind as the dignity, de as the dignity denied Black women was also conceded to those who performed for the white gaze. This point is key. Consider for a moment Oprah's rendition of Alice Walker's The Color Purple, specifically the famous Hell Na scene in which Sophia, a symbol of black female independence and power is disciplined for publicly voicing her refusal to mammy and maid for the mayor's wife, Miss Millie. Oh, look at you, so sweet. Miss Millie always going on over the cup. You children are so clean. Would you like to work for me? Be my maid? Hell no. What did you say? Hell no. What did she say? Hey, can't you pump that crude a little faster? Gail, what did you say to Miss Millie? I said, hell. No, Miss Sophia. No, Miss Sophia, no! Sophia out of jail just to put in the next. She ended up being Miss Millie made after all. May have bought Miss Millie a new car, and she done asked Sophia to teach her how to drive it. Poor Sophia, stuck with Miss Millie for the rest of her life.
We went past the store. Of the H, okay, I've got it. Top the H. Top the H. Okay, here we go. Yes, ma'am, I reckon it was. <sighs> well, let's do the shopping. Here we see how what Carrie refers to as the hegemony of white time disciplines not only Sophia's defense of her time, but also her person, her body, her space, and her children. The temporal hegemony of whiteness not only forces her to give up her time, but simultaneously steals time from her children through her imprisonment and later forced labor. Although a fictionalized scene, Black feminist historians such as Callie Nicole Gross, Shirley Hicks, and Bria Whit Willingham, among others, demonstrate that the civilizing strategies targeting Sophia are no different from those that mark and suspend everyday Black women within a time of endless subjugation and violence. Sophia's existence as the human subject murdered over and over again by the passions of a bloodless and anonymous acronism manifest as the daily indignity of living a present and anticipating a future of acquiescence to white supremacy. Captured by the very system and past that reads her as property to be reclaimed as opposed to the agencental human being she is, Sophia's refusal to mammy, i.e. to deplete time from her family and children alongside her fierce defense of that refusal implies a counter temporal orientation that manifests her rejection to captivity. I believe that it is this same counter temporality resonant in Sandra Bland's response to Insignia that marks her a woman out of time. Scholarship examining gendered anti-Black policing has been instrumental in unpacking how the expectation to insulate white dominance through prescribed performances of Black deference and acquiescence, i.e. civility not only eclipses Black women's agency, but forestalls their mobility by suspending them within a mutilating temporality of gendered anti-Black violence. Andrea Ritchie's work on Black women, policing and violence, and Invisible No More, police violence against Black women and women of color has been particularly useful. According to Ritchie, America's legacy of gendered anti-Black violence originating, originating during slavery remains due, to the civil remains due to civil society's racialized expectation that Black women at all times embody the mammy. From slavery to reconstruction to Jim Crow, civil society's veneration of mammy stem from the ways her submissiveness, maternal labor, domesticity, and piety sustain a white racial order. Unlike her emasculating, womanly aggressive postbellum antithesis, Sapphire, mammy was loyal to the operations of white supremacy. Under this racializing schema, Black women who questioned transgressed and rejected the expectation to Mammy were deemed unruly, uncivil, essentially bad women and bad citizens on account that their behavior neither revered nor served the mechanisms, the mechanics of whiteness. According to historian Talitha LaFloria, following emancipation, black codes prohibiting domestics from leaving employers, employers property and those that required women over 18 to be gainfully employed criminalized the withdrawal of Black women's labor from the white private sphere. Those found violating what we might call mammy codes were arrested and returned to their employers like fugitive slaves or jailed and leased out to work, for the, for work off their fines. Historian Sarah Haley's work at the intersections of race, gender, and incarceration further highlights the ways Black women's agency, particularly in public, has been criminalized. According to Haley, the disp disproportionate number of Black women charged, by, charged with public quarreling, profane language, and unruliness following emancipation were members of the workforce criminalized for the ways their public presence and agental performances assaulted the racialized expectation that all Black women embody the ideal, submissive, demure subjectivity of man. Richie, LaFloria, and Haley's work on gendered anti-Black policing demonstrate how the racialized idea of Black womanhood not only informs social perceptions of Black women, but also, quote, police perceptions of what conduct is appropriate and permissible towards Black women, end quote. This perception, perception of appropriate and permissible treatment towards Black women is grounded in an ideology of whiteness that understands Black women as antithetical to the defenses and protections afforded white women. Historically, Police have perceived Black women as not 
perceive Black and non-Black women of color as subhuman and animalistic, as subjects worthy of violation, fear, and in need of swift and forceful submission and punishment. This perception commonly accompanies instances in which Black women's agency threatens the racial order of things. Such moments routinely solicit an overly aggressive response from law enforcement due to a struggle over legitimacy and authority. Scholarship examining interpersonal strategies exercised during police citizen encounters note that instances of, instances of escalation are routinely the result of officers' struggle to establish authority. Legitimacy and authority are dialectically negotiated through the back and forth process of question and answer in which officers assume an institutional right to direct discourse along with the expectation that citizens adhere to that expectation and answer. Any deviation from this expectation is determined, a fail, is determined a failure to follow the law, AKA a failure to comply and thus a threat. As a story of non-Mamian black woman, quote, Sophia's response implies a rejection to white temple rhetorics that reinscribe Mammy as the ideal performance of black womanhood. Recognizing this temporalization offers insight into how Black women struggle to reclaim their time in the face of logics that suffocate their capacity for a future beyond a stereotype Black past. White simple rhetorics reflect a hierarchy of values that reinscribe civility as deference to logics of white racial order. Thus, if civility is a racist articulation of a past that expresses desire for a particular kind of ordered present and future, then we might read appeal to civility and civilizing strategies as not only modes of racial discipline, but also as the expression of a racialized temporality that manifests in the violent arrest of bodily will that is captioned. As this scholarship demonstrates, civilizing strategies for Black women have historically been violent as civilizing has always assumed the need to return Black women to the place or time of order, to send them back to a time when custom was law. This return of sorts signals one aspect of civility's temporality, as here, returning Black women to a time of order consigns us to a time in which we have no rights, a time in which we are not citizens, a time when law and prevailing logic held that we were neither women nor human. As a materialized scene of unprotected female flesh, Bland's stop offers an instance in which we might observe how the temporal racialization of civilizing strategies may be resisted. Part three, I'm waiting on you, the dialogic of the stop and temporal reclamation. The oppositional gaze. Scholarship on the gaze and surveillance from Bell Hooks to George Yancey to Simone Brown reminds that the right to look, let alone look, judge, and act has been historically a marker of gendered and racialized power. In Black Looks, Bell Hooks examines the gaze as a powerful disciplinary technology that sustains a racist heter heteropatriarchal society. Quote, there is power in looking, Hooks reminds. And what she defines as the oppositional gaze, that is, a mode of resistance informed by a rebellious desire to look with judgment, is a site of agency grounded in Black women's disidentification with the objectifying and dehumanizing gaze of white hegemony. Black looks, writes Hooks, quote, were interrogating gazes that defiantly declared, excuse me, not only will I stare, but that I want to look, I want my look to change reality, end quote. Returning to the stop, we see how Bland's oppositional gaze is voiced through her ability to dialogically assume authority during the encounter. After the initial stop, Insignia returns to issue a ticket. However, rather than addressing Bland once he's returned, Insignia instead stands in silence, actively glaring at Bland th through the window, paternalistically waiting to be acknowledged by her. This moment registers an audible pause in the video long enough to generate questions of intent long enough for us to see how Bland returns the indignity of being stopped back to Insignia. If this is an effort to discipline behavior, then it fails because Bland, unfazed and unbothered, remains silent, subtly looking towards the roadway as she waits to be addressed. Consequently, the burden of breaking the silence falls to Insignia on account of Sandra's own strategic practice of what Cheryl Glenn calls active non-engagement. Insignia is annoyed, the inflection in his voice signaling a rising discontent. 
You okay? To which, to which uh, Bland replies, quote, I'm waiting on you. This is your job. I'm waiting on you. When are you going to let me go? End quote. Bland's I'm waiting on you is significant, inverting the white inclinations to temporal closure by insinuating that the one stuck, that the one who can't get over the past, that the one who's behind the times and needs to catch up is Insinia. I'm waiting on you marks blue time as behind. Sandra's response reflects what Tamika Carey theorizes as rhetorical impatience. Rhetorical impatience denotes instances in which the disciplinary power of Black women's self-care disturbs the hegemony of white time. It is an act of temporal rec reclamation or what, excuse me, <clears throat> of what Waters calls reclaiming my time. That, that exposes the ways white orientations to time perpetuate racial deprivation of time via tacit forms of black women's disrespect. Carrie's theori Carrie theorizes rhetorical impatience as dismissal, as confrontation, as indignant agency, and as repossession. As she explains, these performances of frustration, quote, foreground the assumption that equity and justice for oneself, Black women, and Black communities is already far overdue and thus requires speed and, dec and decisive action. As such, rhetorical impatience functions as a disarm disciplining arm of a Black woman's self care project, end quote. Carrie's interrogation of white time and Kairos is helpful for the ways it draws attention to the social norms informing impatience and determining who has the right to not only be impatient, but also the question of who owns time and who has the right to, to quib over the exasperation of time. Such norms are governed by race and gendered hierarchies that normalize white temple rhetorics that, in assuming ownership of time, trivialize, waste, or transfer time in ways that sustain injustice. A sense of entitlement to other people's time, as Mills makes clear, is characteristic of a white temple orientation and Insignia's performance is performative ins insistence that Bland yield her time to him demonstrates an adherence to this orientation and the presumption of access to and ownership of other people's time. If reclaiming my time is an act of temporal reclamation, that I'm waiting on you as an act of rhetorical impatience that challenges the mechanization of Blue Times white authority to close off Black futures. Conclusion. In red, white, and Black, Frank Wilderson observes how those who speak back to structural forces and demand an account of harm are further disempowered through rhetoric that marks ethical speech like, I'm waiting on you, when are you gonna let me go? And why do I have to put out my cigarette while I'm in my car? crazy. Wilderson asks, what are we to make of a world that responds to the most lucid enunciations of ethics with violence? End quote. During the stop, Bland asks several questions. The most pressing is, why do I have to put out my cigarette while I'm in my car? This question above, above all others, one, voice Bland's discontent and contempt of Insignia's intrusion, and two, wrestled authority away from Insignia by interrogating the legitimacy of the stop. Bland's interrogation of Insignia's assumed right to stop and impede her forward movement corresponds with the state's assumed right to interrupt and demand her time. And Bland was intimately aware of the ways the state used pretext stop to not only immobilize her, but to impede her time and future progression. Bland's late life was comprised of repeated state intrusion, interruption, and seizure. From 2009 to 2014, Bland experienced stints of unemployment and a series of low-wage jobs unrelated to her degree as a result of the 2009 recession. Her efforts to find work were further complicated by the city's need for revenue. As reports from the Justice Department revealed of cities like Ferguson and Baltimore, Houston implemented a system of racialized taxing to finance a variety of city and state operations. Quote, in Harris County, which includes Houston, Proportionately, three times as many Blacks as whites were being arrested and subjected to the harshest punishments in the county, end quote. Bland's first year in search of work was plagued by these constraints. In 2009, Bland received tickets for failure to wear a seatbelt, driving without liability insurance, and speeding, and was fined a total of $876.50. That same year, she was charged for possession of a small amount of marijuana. Her lawyer was able to get the charge and penalty le lessened from prison, uh, le lessened from prison time and a $4,000 fine to $500 and no jail time. 
In 2010, an unemployed and deeply in debt land was fined another $260 for speeding and a minor collision. During sentencing, Bland asked for leniency, explaining that she wasn't able to pay the fine because she was unemployed, but her statement had no effect and a warrant for her arrest was eventually issued for defaulting on payment. Further complicating 2010 was another traffic violation and possession charge, again for a small amount of marijuana. This second possession resulted in a 30-day jail sentence, which, San which Bland then followed with several additional days of what they call sitting out, her $260 traffic fine from earlier that year. These extra days in jail helped Bland work off her fine by earning $100 a day in credits through time served. The deluge of tickets, fines, court costs, as well as her intermittent work continued after, after Bland moved back home to Chicago. By 2014, she owned thousands of dollars in fines and court fees, but hope seemed to be on the horizon. She had landed an interview at her alma mater and the prospects of employment and a means of self-sufficiency were within reach, or so she thought. 2015 was equally stressful, but on July 10th, 2015, Sandy was returning home happy and relieved. She had just secured a position as an outreach coordinator at her alma mater, Prairie View a and near Houston, Texas. It was a serious win. This is all to say that the July 10th, 2015 stop was not a temporary inconvenience for Sandra Bland, as it may be for some, but rather an accumulation of reoccurrences of capture and detention that ultimately resulted in her death. By challenging Insignia's institutional right to interrupt and make demands on her time, Bland, like Sophia, challenges the societal expectation that Black women display any public face other than the historically assumed, other than the one historically assumed for them. As LaFloria and Haley remind, the expectation to Mammy was normalized because custom and law made it so that Mammy was the only public face society permitted Black women to assume. Bland's refusal to deplete her time manifests the counter temporal orientation to racism that challenges the normalized expectation that Black women submit and subject themselves to the violence of white time. This expectation informs state discourse justifying Insignia's actions and use of lethal force during the stop. Former prosecutor Gabriel Chin told NBC News under Pennsylvania e Mems 1977, Insignia was permitted to use force on account that his request that Bland exit the car, quote, obligated her to get out of the car when ordered to do so, end quote. According to Chen, Bland's arrest was justified because it resulted from her failure to heed a legislated expectation to follow the law. Again, a failure to comply. In a statement to the public, Texas District Attorney Elton Mathis further fueled the image of a contentious and uncivil Bland when he claimed that while it was far too early to know how Bland had died in her cell, it was not too early to know why she was in jail. According to Mathis, the video revealed a very combative, Sandy, who was less than a model person during her interaction with the police. Retired NYPD detective Harry Hopp was perhaps the most vocal critic. In a segment which asks, quote, who is to blame for the death of Sandra Bland, end quote. Hopp, while, waiting, while walking viewers through an analysis of the stop, concluded, quote, the whole thing here is that she, Bland, was very arrogant from the beginning, very dismissive of the officer. She was very uncooperative, end quote. According to Hawk, Bland's assault at the hands of a state trooper was a consequence of her own act, her own insolence and incivility. Had Sandy not been uncivil, if she had adhered to the normalized expectation of her, then she would still be alive. In the case of Sandra Bland, misrepresentations of her as very combative, dismissive, uncooperative, and arrogant, and less than a model person, further fueled the image of a contentious and uncivil Black woman whose death, officials argued, was a consequence of her own insolence. Here we see how officials conflate Bland's healthy critique of the state with a disregard for law. According to historian William Sheff, appeals to civility customarily channel dissent, quote, not through forbidding the articulation of radical ideals, but through controlling the discursive framework in which they can be considered and discussed, end quote. As Bland's case illustrates, charges, of incivility grant officers and the state maximum power and minimum responsibility as the power to define appropriate behavior is theirs. What Bland suffered was, quote, a retaliation of free expression, end quote, which the Ferguson report identified as part of a pattern of racial profiling and, want, and unwarranted stops targeting blacks. 
Her death offers an example of how discourse policing the ways Black women show up in public produces murderous effects. Thank you.